Hey everyone, how are you? It is your Wednesday night show. Yes, your Wednesday night when it's Thursday here. <laughs> how are you all? Good to see you. Uh, we got a lot to talk about tonight. But first, I, I want to start the show off with this. I want to kind of get the mood of the room and then I'll say hello to everyone. In the last 72 hours, what is your opinion on what is going on with the Sebastian Rogers case? The, the content you've seen from other creators, the comments you've seen on social media, at what point in this investigation into a missing child do you think we're at? And let me know in the, in the chat and then I'll tell you what I think. And then I'm going to say hello to everyone. Hey, April. April was here earlier. DJ was here, Kathy Lynch, Mamma Mia, Laura T, Elizabeth Betty C, how are you, my friend? Good to see you. Marilyn Landis, Marilyn Landis, sounds like something you yell at someone at a traffic light. Marilyn Landis, uh, Amy007 is here. Robbie T, hey, Robbie T, how are you, my friend? C Kathy Lynch again, Sienna. Good to see you, Sienna. I Hate Mornings and Shock I hear Kibby, hey, my friend, how are you? Good to see you. Uh, Marjorie is also here. Hey, Marjorie. Foul play, okay. Yeah. I think maybe I explained it wrong. <laughs> I mean, like, where... the point in the investigation that I see right now we're treading awfully close to Summer Wells territory. I mean, in the way that people are acting, uh, content creators and people posting online and in Twitter and Facebook groups, we're getting awfully close to that kind of level of rubbish. And I get a lot of emails every day saying, Ping, why don't you cover Sebastian more? Why wasn't there anything on Sebastian last night? Because there's no good information. Like, if there was something really riveting, something that I felt we could uh, discuss, then I would bring it on and we would talk about it. But I'm not going to sit here and just talk about nothing for an hour and a half. And just, you know, I saw a channel, and I don't, I'm not going to name the channel. I saw a channel, and they were dissecting the mother's blinks in the interview. Like, her eyes blinking. They were dissecting how many times she blinked per minute. And they're like, yes, yes, on Thursday, we're going to have an expert on eye, eye movements come on the show and tell us how, uh, you know, is this normal blinking behavior or is she under, you know, some kind of uh, stress situation? And I'm like, is this really where we've gone in a month? And we've gone to eye blinking in four weeks. I mean... It is uh, frustrating. Let's let, let's just concentrate on finding the kid, and uh, let's just get him back to whatever guardian is the, he needs to go back to. Uh, Kathleen says, "I think it happened at home, but there is no proof." I believe the same about Summer. Yes. Right. Uh, it it becomes like a information vacuum. So when there's not enough fresh information coming out, people start filling that vacuum with like whatever they can make up or not make up. Or, like they'll take the tiniest little points of contention and turn them into an hour and a half show. And uh, just know that I will, I will never do that. It drives me crazy. And I, I see it happen all the time on social media. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm any better than anyone else. I'm just saying it's what I see. I just uh, drives me a bit bit bonkers. Um, like I saw some weird stuff online in the last twenty four hours to do with Sebastian. But uh, let's uh, let's go what we're doing today. Today there was this. I couldn't believe it. Four people dead, five others injured in Northern Illinois stabbing. Suspect in custody. Apparently. One of them was one of the people that were injured or was involved was a mail worker, and they actually had people from the mail like association there. I'll find out what they're called. Hold on, I've never heard of this in an investigation ever. 
Let me see if I can find out what they're actually called. Um, no, I can't. But when I come across it, I will tell you. But it says here, four people were killed and five were hurt in stabbings in northern Illinois on Wednesday. A suspect is in police custody and was being questioned Wednesday afternoon. According to the Rockford Police Chief, Carla Red. She said one of the people who was wounded remains in critical condition. She said, my heart goes out to the families right now that are suffering a loss. I mean, two days before Good Friday, we could all practice a bit more, uh, you know, patience and uh, forgiveness. You know, we don't need any more dead people. It says here, she said the Rockford police received a medical call about 1.14 p.m., followed by additional calls for police and paramedics. Red said, in the city, we have four individuals who are deceased. We have one that's in critical condition right now, an additional four that are in stable condition. There she is there, Rockford Police Chief Carla Red, giving a media update. Said, not all victims had stab wounds. No, note, not all victims, yeah, not all victims had stab wounds and none were shot. Three people died at the scene, the fourth died at a hospital. They said, we don't believe there are any other suspects that are on the run at this stage. Right now, we don't have a clear motive as to what caused this individual to commit such a heinous crime. Red said residents in the area were being asked to review their home surveillance camera for footage for anything related to the attacks. I mean, that is a lot of people to just randomly be stabbed and then die. Oh, my camera's not on. Hold on. Hey, guys. How are you? Hey, good to see you all out there. Hope you're having a good day. Wednesday. Yes, Wednesday. Got to remind myself because it's Thursday here. <laughs> so I got to remember that you guys are a day behind. Uh, let's listen to the uh, the press update on this from WREX13, which is a local news outlet. Uh, good afternoon. Let me just start by saying I can't, words can't even express the, my thoughts right now, this is a pretty painstaking event. Um, my heart goes out to the families right now who are suffering a loss. At 1.14 this afternoon, a call was received at our dispatch center, came in in the 2300 block of Holmes for a medical call. Uh, at that point, we started receiving additional calls in reference to um, not only paramedic needs, but the police department to respond. We responded to the area. We have multiple scenes at this point, which um, we're still working on notifying families. I can tell you we have uh, in the city of Rockford, this is a multi-jurisdictional event, uh, which involves the county as well, where we have in the city of Rockford, we have four individuals who are deceased. We have one that's in critical condition right now and an additional four that are in stable condition. Um, we are working with, we have our federal partners on scene as well. I will also tell you the call came in at 1.14 this afternoon. We do have a suspect in custody who is currently at one of the stations. So in regards to, and I should have said this earlier, media briefing, I'm not gonna take questions. I'm just gonna give you what we have. So with that, being said, we have a suspect in custody who is being interviewed at this time. Um, we don't believe there's any other suspects that are on the run or at large at this particular time. Okay, so I'm going to let the Sheriff's Department, uh, Sheriff Caruana will cover what took place in the county. Yeah, good afternoon. Thank you for you know, coming and showing interest. Um, I want to thank, you know, again, the Rockford Police, us working together along with all the federal agencies that are out here to help us work uh, on this situation. Terrible situation. Um, like the chief said, it started this afternoon a little bit after one, and it was in custody around 1, 1.35 uh, in the afternoon. We are. <laughs> I would love to play that all for you, but he is so quiet, it is hard to, like, hear. It's hard to hear him talk. And he's sort of like, yeah, 135 today. Got a call out there. Uh, yeah, we sent some police. And by 2.30, it was all finished. <laughs> That's sort of what it sounds like to me. And I've got it completely boosted to like 200. So 
I don't know what it sounds like to you guys, but probably worse. Uh, so we'll leave it there. I will post a link if you guys want to watch the full uh, super quiet press conference. Yeah, I'll put it on the screen. There you go. You can copy that down for people who cannot see the chat on the replay. Shock says, it seems there's like much more crime now with cameras in everywhere than when there were very few. You know, I, you know, I like weather. I, I do a lot in weather, you know, tornadoes and things like that. There's an old um, sort of question in, in weather. People are like, are there more tornadoes happening or are people just got more cameras? now to take photos of them and video of them and i think it's sort of the same with true crime i think we have the same type of is there more cameras or more crime and it's hard to know i think we figured out with tornadoes it was just more cameras there's more people around people are living in more rural areas so there's more people around to take uh video and things like that and everyone now has a uh a camera in their phone like everyone has one so it's easier to take like video or a photo as where 20 years ago, not everyone was just walking around with a camera or a video, like a video camera. Uh, so, yeah. Aha, uh -huh, Kathy Lynch says, I have on, have on a headset so I could hear them. I think he was basically just repeating what she said. Like she said, I like her. She was saying, I'm just going to give you the facts of what we have. I really like that. I wish uh, they would do that more. Uh, so let's bring you some more information. Apparently, a few days ago in Rockford, this happened, and they've had a really tough week out there in Illinois. It says, man charged with murder after stabbing of black teen worker at Illinois Walmart, Timothy Carter, 28, in custody over killing of Jason Jenkins, 18, in attack, criminal complaint says appears to be racially motivated. So I don't know. I don't think they're connected. Just that they've had a tough week in this town, apparently. As you can see, Rockford, Illinois police. Stabbing victim, an adult male, was stabbed by another adult male inside the Walmart on Northridge and is being treated for serious injuries. The suspect is in custody and there is no threat to the public. So they had this um, three days ago on the 25th and now a couple of days later you you have another stabbing where four people died i mean what is going on in the world it's easter everyone eat your chocolate easter eggs and your reese's chocolate chocolate eggs and be happy everyone be happy eat your chocolate eggs um thanks amy huh That's interesting. I will. Oh, thanks, Amy. I'll I'll bring that up in a minute. Hey, Red Like Wine. How are you? It's good to see you, Emily Nab, my good friend. Glad to have you. Here. Yeah. So this town has had a really tough few days. So if you are in Rockford, Illinois, or you live in the surrounding areas of Illinois, just remember when you're out and about over Easter, that towns around you are having a bit of a tough time and maybe if you know someone from this area give them a call see if they're all right um you know their town seems to have had a really rough you know week apparently a lot of stabbing people are getting getting stabbed for some reason it's not good that this seems to be a racially motivated attack either we don't need any more of those yeah, I can show you a little thing on it here. Inside a Rockford Walmart leaves one person dead. The 18-year-old victim, Jason Jenkins, was an employee at the store. Timothy Carter's accused of first-degree murder in his death. The 28-year-old's being held in the Winnebago County Jail. Carter appeared in court for the first time this afternoon. Drea Baroni was there. And Drea, what did you learn? Mimi, just hours ago, Timothy Carter appeared over Zoom to a crowded courtroom inside the Winnebago courthouse. Friends and family of Jason Jenkins filled that room. 
The Auburn High School student was stabbed in the back while working at Walmart last night. He later died from his injuries. According to the criminal complaint, Carter was walking through the store with two knives, a kitchen knife and a hunting knife. Police say video shows him walking up to the 18-year-old with the knives and stabbing him in the back once while saying a racial slur. The coroner's report shows Jenkins later died of that stab wound. At the court hearing today, Jenkins' family and friends were visually distraught and angry. I even heard some of them yelling as they walked out of the courthouse less than 24 hours after Jason's murder. Rockford Public Schools offered grief counseling today at Auburn and Roosevelt High Schools. Coming up at 5, I'll have more on Carter's next court appearance and the push to keep him in jail. So just three days ago, you had this happen, and then today you had um, a mass casualty event with four other people stabbed to death, plus a bunch of others who were in the hospital. Uh, I mean, what the hell? What can you say? I, it's really horrible. Uh, let's have a look. Apparently, it says the Rockford police received a medical call around 1.14 p.m., followed by additional calls for police and paramedics. And what does it say here? I'm just trying to see if it had anything about... Yeah, see, the violence Wednesday comes days after a teenage employee of Walmart in Rockford was stabbed and killed inside the store. Today, we are shocked by another horrific act of violence against innocent members of our community. That was Rockford Mayor Tom McNamara. And you can see these police. I read something about a mailman. I'll have to try and find it. There was something about apparently a mailman was one of the people who were possibly injured. And they actually had, like, whoever controls all the mail workers were on the scene. I have to try and have a look. Hold on. Maybe it's in here. Uh-huh, here. It says, uh, A postal worker was involved, but no further details. The U.S. Postal Service later told WREX that one of their mail carriers was killed. The suspect is in custody at Rockville Police Station, according to uh, Red, which is that lady there who said a motive has not been identified. He is described only as a 22-year-old man and was taken into custody about 20 minutes after the first call came through. Uh, the attacks took place in several block area of southeastern Rockville, police said, with the first call coming in about 1.15 uh, p.m. Let's see. It said apparently the suspect got into a home and confronted a woman who tried to get away she suffered a stab wound to her hands and face and is a is in and is in hospital in critical condition. A good Samaritan was stabbed for trying to help her. Neighbors described the scene to WEX W <laughs> R E X reporters. They said all of a sudden we heard police run up both sides of the house screaming, Stop, get down. Then they ran into the backyard, and after a few minutes, we saw them bringing the suspect down the driveway in handcuffs, and he was very bloody because he stabbed a bunch of people. That, that tends to be what happens. Let me find out from WREX if they have anything else. Let's see. Rockford Live. We're back this evening with continuing coverage of the deadly attack that took place this afternoon on Rockford Southeast Side. Four people killed, multiple injured. 13 WREX's William Ingalls, one of the first reporters at that scene. And William, tell us what's the mood in that neighborhood tonight? Brittany, it is a shocked and somber one tonight. I do want to walk you through exactly why this crime scene is so big and why we've even been continued to get moved back. We're about a block further than we were on 13 News at 4. And really, since this scene started earlier today, going to have our photojournalist Nathan Langley kind of go down. You can see really where those last police lights still are is about as not even as far back as this scene goes. It goes back almost about a half block further beyond that. That's because we heard of so many victims. You heard of four people dead. 
four people injured uh, and one in critical condition as well. I mean, this is why when there are this many victims and we even heard uh, from police earlier that so many different good Samaritans trying to rush in and help people who are involved in this, this violent act. This is why you see a scene so big and why you see so many officers still to this moment going through all the evidence, trying to find anything they can, because this is something that will absolutely be going to court. And you heard all the people in passion that this will not stand. That happens in the courtroom. And that's why they're working so hard to find evidence for now reporting live in Rockford for 13 WREX. I'm William Ingalls. Brittany, back to you. All right, William, thank you for that update. And we also have some new information just into our newsroom at this hour. Mayor Tom McNamara announcing support services for the victims will be offered tomorrow at Flynn Middle School. That's happening at 9 a.m. There will be Rosecrans specialists on site to offer those counseling services. Uh, the city said in an effort to support loved ones and families of the victims, as well as residents of the neighborhood. They have arranged for emotional support and also counseling services to be available. You know, it is uh, great that we see counseling services available uh, after these type of events, but we also need them available before they happen. You know, not reactive, we need proactive. Uh, Shock, Shock says, my son is a psych nurse in an adolescent unit. It's terrible how many young people have severe problems. They will all become adults and will be out on the streets. Yes, that is true. Um, yeah, there we go. I just checking anything else. They're just saying the man is a 22 year old. No further details at this time. No new details on the conditions of those injured either. Four others are stabilized at area hospitals, including a good Samaritan who was trying to help one of the hurt people. So yeah, you can see like what a widespread area this took place over. Let me see if I can blow this up enough. It took place on like all these different uh, connecting uh, avenues and streets. Cleveland, uh, Eggleston, and Holmes Street. It's a big area. You saw in that video all the police tape. There was so much of it. It was everywhere. It looked like a uh, state fair. It was just covering. Um, I don't know. Moonlight View says why. I have no idea. No idea why someone would do this. All right. If I get more information on that, I will let you know and we'll keep an eye on it. I know people are looking into the bridge uh, updates. I know there was a little bit. Actually, I had some information from Australia on the bridge. Give me a second and I'll find it. There was some. Okay. So apparently the people who owned this uh, shipping company, I'm going to show you something. Uh, it says, violations were deemed so serious by the Australian Maritime Safety Authority that the Western Kaleo, owned by Singapore company Grace, Grace Ocean Private, was banned from Australian ports for six months in 2021. That's the same company who owns the Dali. And apparently they have been done with many maritime uh, violations, including serious and shameful mistreatment of crew members, including keeping them on board for over a year when they're only supposed to be on ships for a maximum of nine months. And they have uh, breached this condition several times while entering Australian waters. So they were saying in this document uh, that uh, this company cuts corners a lot and uh, <coughs> mistreats their workers, apparently. Some workers were owed up to $40,000 in pay they had not received. And... Um, had been kept on the boats for many months here. During the inspection in 2021, 13 crew members were collectively owed $40,000 and had been on board for more than a year, despite promises to replace them after nine months. The year beforehand, the, sh the same ship had been inspected in New South Wales 
and eight crew members had been on board for more than 11 months. Imagine being on board for 11 months at sea. It would be crazy. You wouldn't even know what land was like anymore. You'd, you'd have jelly legs every time you went to something uh, solid, solid ground. You wouldn't be able to walk. Uh, it also says um, 10 crew members on board the Furnace Southern Cross, another Grace Ocean-owned ship, were on there for 14 months, according to the authority's executive operations director, Michael Drake. In a statement at the time, he blasted the serious and shameful breaches of the Maritime Labor Convention. So apparently this company is known to cut corners. And uh, up here they were saying the black smoke seen in the video when it crashed into the bridge could be from dirty fuel. And apparently uh, marine fuel contaminants are quite common and they create that black smoke you see because it's not burning correctly. Uh, it says here, contaminants include water, dirt, algae, and it says here, uh, marine fuel had turned into a witch's brew of industrial products, resulting in hundreds of engine failures in recent years that had left ships powerless. So... Apparently that could have been why it kept losing power and blacking out was because it had dirty fuel inside. So you can see there was here's one of the uh, the victims they have identified: uh, Dorian Castillo Cabrera, who was just 26 years old, and I think there was another one, uh, Alejandro Hernandez Fuentes. So he was 35. He was one of the people working on the uh, the potholes on the bridge, and he passed away. They're now saying that they had rescued two bodies today, I think. They're saying that they will not be able to rescue any more remains of victims at this time because there is too much bridge material in the water that has crushed the vehicles, and it is too dangerous for... Uh, divers to get down that far apparently some places in the water over eight meters in depth so it's quite a quite a serious situation for the uh for the divers so they're now into what they call a recovery salvage operation not not uh not search and recovery not a you know, not anything else. It's now a salvage recovery operation, which basically means, yeah, not good things for the families, unfortunately. Yeah, it doesn't seem good on that ship. Sherry runs late. Well, you have to wonder how they kept them on board for over a year. I mean, isn't that kidnapping people? Keeping them on, on a ship for that long? <laughs> Sherry Ronslate said, My mom just found out today that the company she worked for the past 22 years was sold. However, they kept her on and gave her a dollar raise. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I'm not sure. Um, so that's the update out of Australia for the uh, ship. That's, yeah, they're saying that that company is well known in Australian uh, waters and they uh, don't have a very good reputation at all, you know, very abusive to their workers and, yeah, cut corners. So <clears throat> there you go. That's what happens. You run into a bridge, kill how many people? Eight people, ten people, whatever it is, it's too many. Yo! Hey. What the? <laughs> Random video. All right. Let's keep going. I have more stories for you. If I can find them. Okay. We'll head to Australia for a minute, but you guys have to give me a second. Hold on. 
Hold on, my friends. One second. Uh, Marjorie, I think there are laws for maritime which are global that are like sort of um, minimum standards that all shipping companies must apply to. So, all right. Do you all remember that video we watched last year of a young girl being brutally tortured by three other young girls? Well, they've been in court today. I'll show you this. This was the video. I'll turn the volume down. You guys, if you guys remember this, I showed you the uncensored version of this video with no blurring, and it was uh, brutal to watch. This girl in the back of this corner was abused and tortured. They stabbed her, hit her, bashed her, uh, she had very serious injuries by the time she went home. Now, these other girls have... Yeah, there's a knife that they whacked her with and cut her. And they're hitting her. And they're making fun of her because she's a she's a girl who is uh, a different shape to them. Those other girls are all very thin and, you know, she's a little bit of a uh, different size girl. And they're making fun of her. They're saying, oh, you're a disgusting pig. And I've never seen something so horrible in my life. And uh, they are abusing her and hitting her. So here we go. It says, the teens befriended their 13-year-old victim days before luring her to a home in Tawanton in Queensland's Sunshine Coast in March last year. The girl was assaulted, taunted, and cut with a knife while being recorded for footage which later went viral on TikTok. One girl, 14, pleaded guilty to 47 offences, including armed robbery, assault, occasionally bodily harm, and deprivation of liberty. A second girl, 15, pleaded guilty to assault, occasionally bodily harm, deprivation of liberty, entering, dwelling, and commit indictable offence, armed robbery while in company used personal violence, and assault occasionally bodily harm, bodily harm while armed in company. The 14-year-old was on Wednesday sentenced to two years detention suspended and placed on probation for three years at the Maruchidor District Court. Uh, she has been in custody for 218 days, so about just under a year, about 10 months. I think this is ridiculous. I mean, look what they did to that poor girl. They acted as a gang. They ganged up on her. And she only spends about 10 months in prison. And then they gave her a sentence, but then suspended it. What's the point? She's going to think she got away with it. She's going to think she's going to be this big hero to all her friends. Look what I did. They let me go. I I got out of it. So, not very happy with the sentencing. It says uh, the second girl, the, it's only the 14-year-old that was sentenced. I'm just trying to see if the 15-year-old got her. Okay, the 15-year-old girl, the older girl, she will be sentenced on April 22nd. And she's only served 126 days in pre-sentencing custody. Apparently, the 12-year-old girl remains before the courts, and there's no information on her. I'm guessing because she's under 14. The Crown Prosecutor had told the court the 13-year-old victim was lured to the Taunton home under false pretense before the savage attack began. Uh, it was horrible what they did to that poor girl in the middle. She'll never be the same. She'll probably never trust any females again in her life. They said she had her hair pulled out, she was spat on, threatened, cut with a knife, and had her hands bound with a cord during the terrifying four-hour ordeal. 
Uh, they also attempted to smash bottles over her head and forced the girl to lick their feet. The victim also copped a barrage of verbal abuse from her attackers who called her a stinky bitch and the ugliest thing they had ever seen. A, bro- a bone was broken in her wrist and the victim was so badly beaten she was temporarily unable to stand or see. The teens filmed the torture and took before pics prior to the victim's assault. The girls walked the injured 13-year-old home following the attack and let themselves in her home uninvited despite being told to leave. Apparently, they also followed her mum and the victim to the hospital to keep an eye on the victim to make sure that, that they didn't get in trouble and she didn't rat on them. So these girls knew exactly what they were doing. Here's that photo. We we saw the uh, uncensored version of this last year. That girl's face looked unrecognizable. She was uh, black and blue all over. You can see just how many injuries she has everywhere. Like her bra here is blood, like has blood all over it. She, poor girl. She did not deserve what happened to her at all. I'm just trying to see if there's anything else. So the court heard both the 14-year-old and the 15-year-old had troubled upbringings. The 15-year-old began smoking marijuana at age 12 after disassociating from school and had been assaulted while in youth detention. Yes, because of what you did. The 14-year-old began drinking alcohol at just 10, having witnessed and been the victim of violence in her own home. She and her family were bombarded by threats after she was identified online as being involved in the torture. Yeah, their house ended up being burnt down. I don't know if you guys remember that, but they ended up burning down their home. But their home was a public housing uh, property, so it didn't, didn't hurt anyone else but another family that could have lived there. So the house got burnt down. It took a house away from another family and it didn't do anyone any good and it didn't punish anyone but an innocent family. So it was a very silly thing to do. Hold on. Who is PMing me? Uh, Yes. uh, Thank you, Laura. I know. Um... That is the same thing that Amy sent me. We'll get on to that after this, I promise. I'm trying to see. (laughs) Uh, Hey, Gambler. Gambler says, first time since my mum's passing, just to the corner store for some pop and Pepto. I I hope you're doing okay, Gambler. I really am. I I hope you're coping okay without your mum. I know that must be very difficult. Very difficult. Yeah, she is a a lovely girl, the uh, victim in this. We need to stop. um... I I thought it had changed. I thought, you know, girls didn't... uh attack each other over weight anymore but seems they still do no the girls are not rich these are girls from uh disadvantaged uh situations uh shock says those girls will have children one day that is uh scary yes Hey, Robin Lane, how are you, my friend? Hey, Four Sons Mom, good to see you. Uh, Let me try and find... It makes it hard because we cannot name these two, so it makes it more difficult to find information about them. Hold on. to wanton uh, da, da.
Let's see if I can find a video for you. Uh huh. Yes. So this was last year. Let me see if I can find it for you. Queenslanders. The house where a teenager was allegedly held captive and tortured for hours has been set on fire as a community vents its fury. This is vigilante justice. The house where a teenage girl was allegedly held captive and tortured by fellow teens, now a smouldering wreck. Once the roof started to collapse in, you know, just boom, it was gone. That scene has been declared as a crime scene. We are treating it as a suspicious arson matter. Because the Tawantan property had become notorious as the scene of this bullying video that went viral on TikTok. One girl brutally tormented by others. Legally, we can't reveal the identity of anyone involved, but where it happened has been shared online and people have been breaking in and trashing the property for days. Uh, the amount of strangers down the street and the uh, criminal activity going on at the property based on the recent activity of the residents, it wasn't a surprise. The home is owned by the Queensland Housing Commission. Its occupants left days ago. It's pretty scary to know that that sort of thing's been going on. The anger in the area is palpable. Police will also investigate racist flyers being dropped in letterboxes. This is a, a direct attempt by individuals that don't live on the Sunshine Coast to incite ra radical behaviour and um, racially motivated behaviour. The three youths charged with assault today appeared in the Maroochydore Children's Court. Nine youths applied for and was granted access to the hearing, but the matter was adjourned after the children's lawyers objected to us being there to report on the case. Meg Sides, Nine News. So there is a little refresher from last year. Yeah, so they burnt down the home and yeah. I, I think we could, uh, if you have daughters out there, especially young ones, like between, you know, three and 15, gotta, we got to try and teach our young women that um, size doesn't matter and that, we don't bully people over their physical appearance. And you know what's really funny? One, I, will, I have this conversation with people my age, and we're like, you know what's really interesting? The girls who were bullied in high school for, the, for being a little overweight or a little chubby or whatever, they ended up being the hottest girls when they get older. And we're like, wow, they turned into stunning women. Like, And it just shows you sometimes girls are just growing into their body at that age and you know you never you know shouldn't be judging them because they're still growing and they're still you know uh getting you know into adult adulthood and you know they might may look different in a few years so yeah we've had that conversation before that a lot of those girls end up being beautiful women like when they grew up and they didn't deserve the bullying that they got for their you know, weight issues or whatever. And some of the really hot, attractive girls in high school ended up, um, you know, not faring as well. So it's funny how life turns out and that maybe we should all remember that, that high school is a finite amount of time. It's very small in the grand scheme of everything. And um, yeah, don't bully people because of what they look like in a small period of time. Oh, Reby says, last Saturday I had to call an ambulance because my mother fell over while I was in the shower. I only had her at emergency room the day before. They wouldn't admit her into hospital. They must just know you by look. They're like, oh, Reby's back. Hey, hey, Mrs. Mrs. Reby's mom. <laughs> oh, your poor mom. She's having like what happened to my granddad. Actually, you know what's interesting? Before my grandfather died last year, he kept going back to the hospital so much from falling like what's happening with you that they didn't want to release him back to the family because they were saying that his home was unsafe because he kept falling over they're like well you can't pick him up on your own you need an ambulance every time 
therefore his his home is unsafe and they didn't want to release him shock said boys can be bullies uh, bullied too we've done a lot on boys we haven't done much on women actually we've done a lot on young men um that's why i kind of did it tonight because i don't think we've done a lot on uh teenage age women so uh but yes you're right but it's i think it's slightly different it's it's, it's uh done in a different way for boys it's it's um it's slightly different girls can be really cruel to other women as where boys are bullied in a more direct sort of way and then ostracized uh from the male peer group uh, uh, women are a little catty and they you know can draw things out over many months <laughs> so uh yeah it's sort of different but i i think it's goes goes to say we shouldn't shouldn't judge anyone on how they look at 15 because you won't look like that when you're 25 <laughs> you will not and high school really doesn't matter once you get out of it. Everyone forgets what happened there and goes on to live their lives and all that type of thing. Well, you better get two Pepto-Bismols. That way you don't have to walk to the shops tomorrow if you need another one. <laughs> Kathy says, once you go to a high school re reunion, you realize no one is thin anymore. That's right everyone's had far too many puddings over the years and uh no one is the thin hot one anymore that's right but yeah no it's just a funny thing uh everyone i speak to that has seen people from back in school they're like wow that girl that used to get picked on turned into the most beautiful woman and then they're always like you remember stacy the real hot one and then you know oh wow look what happened to her and it's just everyone i speak to has the same story about high school people right and that social the social media bully, bullying is getting crazy i don't think i would have survived high school with what they have to deal with now i i don't know how they do it, it it's uh relentless imagine go, imagine when i was bullied at at school I, uh, at three o'clock, I got to go home. So it's stopped for the day, right? You get to go home, your house is a refuge, and you're safe. Not now. There's social media, they bully you until 11 o'clock at night until you go to sleep, and then in the morning you wake up and it, it's already started again. And then you've got to go actually see the people at school. It's way worse now, and I don't know how kids deal with it. It's, um, very hard I, I i feel for the kids getting bullied it it, it it must be incredibly hard that's right that's right red like wine no i wouldn't either i i think there's no way i don't know how they how they cope i, I there's no way i could do it ah uh, they the kids who get bullied now have they they must be way stronger than i am uh they even at 15 they must be so strong i mean i don't know how they how they do it i really don't and uh it's brutal the fact that you can't switch off anymore that's you know it's in your life 24 hours a day they email they social media they get other people to contact you they you know call you they abuse they send photos they photoshop i mean so hard yeah and I, I i get why it must be relent relentless it really must so i feel sorry for those people um yeah must be very difficult uh that's why when you see things like this happen a two-year or three-year suspended sentence helps no one who does it help it doesn't help the victim she's still in the same area as her perpetrators she's still going to see them it gives her no relief they've only been gone for i don't know eight months ten months that's it now they're back in her suburb again now what sure they might not come near her sure they might not bash her again but they'll still be there 
and they'll still be around the corner and her psychological uh, state will always be on edge because she knows they're there. The idea of jail is partially to give the victims some peace and quiet and uh, reassurance that they're not going to just bump into them at the shop. That's part of what a prison sentence is for. It's to give the victim time to heal. And in, in this one, I don't think she's getting it. I think releasing these uh, perpetrators so quickly is an injustice to the victim. It really is. I know they're young. I know maybe they could learn, but it's not fair to the victim. Uh, Lux said, if I had kids, I wouldn't put them in public school due to gun violence and bullying. It's a war zone. I agree. Uh, Emily Knob says, weird enough, I was bullied for being skinny. I guess it goes both ways. Yeah, there was a couple of um, there was a couple of girls at my school who were very sporty, like very thin and lanky. They didn't develop, like they didn't have any boobs and they didn't get any, you know, girly features because they were very sporty and uh, they did a lot of running and track and things like that. And they got bullied relentlessly for not looking girly enough and i remember those they were, they were friends of mine uh yeah very sad uh marilyn said they gave them a slap on the wrist why because they came from disadvantaged and abusive households so the court is saying it's monkey see monkey do so they're saying they're only mimicking what they have been subjected to is it true? I don't know. I'm not a psychologist. I have no idea. Uh, Red Luck Wine says, look at the movie Girl Fight and Odd Girl Out. It depicts the way girls are typically bullied, but today with the internet. I'll have a look. I will have a look. Um, Revy says, I was bullied for being too mature because I wouldn't give in to the peer pressure and do dumb teenage stuff. It always made me laugh. I thought maturity was a good thing. Yeah. It, I don't think it's I don't think it's because you were mature. I think it's because you were different. Because you were different and weren't doing the the expected probably, you know, you know, stuff that teenagers do. That's why you were bullied. <laughs> Marilyn says, yay, peer pressure. Yay. All right. We'll do this one next. Where is it? Where is it? Apparently, I cannot find my links. Hold on, people. Oh, here it is. Ah. Let's pause this. Hold on. Riley Strain's body found with no pants, wallet, or boots. Well, the wallet thing makes uh, sense. The pants make, uh, you know, some, you could come up with reasons why. And the boots, well, we'll see. It says the family has ordered a second autopsy. Okay. It says when his body was recovered from the Cumberland River, Riley Strain was not wearing his pants wallet or cowboy boots he had on the night he went missing leaving his family and friends grappling for answers according to a family friend the only thing that was found with him as police stated in the report was the watch and the shirt wait did they not find his phone the university of missouri student 22 was last seen on march 8 when he vanished during a night out with friends in downtown nashville his body was found two weeks later in the Cumberland River after a massive search effort. It says here, On Saturday, March 23, the Metro Nashville Police Department confirmed to News Nation affiliate WKRN that Strain's preliminary autopsy had been completed, adding his death continued to appear accidental with no foul play related trauma. However, the family has ordered a second autopsy in hopes of obtaining more information. The family spokesman said, the family deserves more answers than we have now. What One puzzling detail from the first autopsy was a medical examiner stating Strain had no water in his lungs, raising questions about the circumstances of his death. 
Well, given the height of that bank, if he had fallen off the edge and hit his head, he wouldn't be breathing probably as hard as a drowned victim would have. He may have been unconscious, meaning there wasn't any water aspirated into his lungs or into his throat. Maybe, I don't know. I'm not a doctor. It's just something. It says here, usually water in the lungs means they were alive when they went into the water. Could mean they were unconscious too. Uh, despite ongoing inquiries, there are still in individuals the police have yet to interview, including those from a homeless encampment near where Strain's body was found. Family spokesman said, I think there's somebody out there that knows what actually happened that night. Strain's funeral is scheduled for Friday in his hometown. Good Friday. They're going to put him to rest. Let's see what the video has to say from News Nation. Riley Strain. Hey, that's not how we do it. 22 year old's body was recovered from the Cumberland River in Nashville last Friday, two weeks after he went missing during a night out with friends. Tonight, we've learned some disturbing details about how he was found. We've learned he was found without his pants, his wallet, or the cowboy boots that he was wearing the night he vanished. Surveillance video captured some of his last known steps on March 8th after he left the downtown bar where his fraternity brothers were. Uh, they were all partying together there. It was about eight miles away from where his body was found. His disappearance mobilized an army of loved ones and strangers alike banding together to look for signs of Riley before the search came to a tragic end. Preliminary autopsy found no signs of foul play in his death, but the family is not completely satisfied tonight. They have ordered a second autopsy with even more tests that will potentially give us more insight into what happened. And joining us now, family friend uh, Chris Dingman. Uh, Chris, thank you for coming on the show again. Um, I, I understand that Riley has been returned home. His funeral will be happening on Friday. So we're obviously thinking of you all right now. And I, I can't imagine how difficult all of this has been. But I, I want to ask you about this second autopsy and some of the new information uh, you've learned. What, what's new here? Uh, the family did have a second autopsy, actually in Tennessee, following the uh, Metro Nashville autopsy. Uh, from a private individual company that does that. Um, the, the original autopsy came out just like theirs did with, you know, no obvious signs of trauma, as in weapons, uh, guns or knives or et cetera. Uh, but they were able to do a little bit more testing on specific items. Uh, one thing that threw the family for a loop was, uh, you know, the coroner going on record with uh, a news person in Nashville stating about the lack of water in his lungs. Uh, it raises more questions. You know, uh, I, I'm not a crime drama person by no means, but usually water in the lungs uh, means that, you know, they were alive when they went into the water. So more questions. Uh, we hope they're going to get some answers with the toxicology. Uh, you know, I just I just hope that this doesn't get swept underneath the rug because the family deserves more more answers than we have. What about the boots, Chris? Tell us what you've learned in terms of what uh, Riley was wearing and what he wasn't wearing when he was discovered. Uh, Riley, we were we were told, which blew the family away. It actually went out on social media, and I screenshotted it and sent it to our our war room, and was like, "Who in the world is this? Who is releasing this information?" Because at the time, certain family members didn't even know about that, uh, which really kind of blew us away. Not sure how they got that information. Once again, more one more question. But uh, yeah, unfortunately, the only thing that was found with him, uh, as the police stated in the report was the watch and the shirt. Uh, everything else was not with him when he was found. And if you can describe the boots that he was wearing, because that could end up being significant. Uh, his mother was pretty sure they were Justin's and they were a square nose style cowboy boot, uh, kind of a flat color. Uh, once again, the jeans were, I think, uh, buckle is what the jeans were. Uh, we already knew about the Michael Kors billfold. You know, there's specific things that we've been out in front of this entire time looking for in case this did come up. So uh, we're hoping now that maybe that they will come. I have to pause it for a second because copyright. Um, if they had one autopsy done and they had a second autopsy done in Nashville and they're waiting for the toxicology, the people who do these autopsies are not dumb. If they thought 
he was dead before he entered the water, they probably would have already told the family that. They probably already would have already said, hey, look, we think there's some foul play or something that he was dead before he hit the water. I think maybe they think maybe you'd have to look at the autopsy report. Does he have any injuries to his head? Is there any like did he knock his head or something like that? Could he have been unconscious somehow? Could he could he have, he have suffered that uh, thing Gambler was talking about last time? That P, that P, uh, men who P can get like a, a stroke, uh, like a momentary stroke condition. Um, it's happened before in men who have been peeing off the edge into water, especially when they've been drinking. I don't know. I'm not a I'm not a uh, medical examiner, but we think there could be more details. So, not saying the family should release it. That's their, you know, that's their, that's their thing. That information is private to them. But um, they might be able to figure out what happened to him just, you know, reading through the details or asking maybe a university doctor to have a look at the, uh, the report done by each ME. Maybe they can have a look and he can tell you what he thinks, what his opinion is, instead of uh, YouTubers giving their opinion because we don't know we're not medical examiners so maybe we'll find out maybe maybe i just think those banks were really high right we remember we saw them they're so tall even if the water was up 30 percent um there's still like a lot of concrete a lot of sharp things Oh, was it not you? I thought it was you. Sorry. I can't remember who it was. Someone brought it up when we were talking about the San Antonio uh, victims in the water. Uh, Let's see. Hey, Lisa. Italians had a difficulty here when they were immigrants. There was prejudice against Southern Europeans. Yeah. They used to call them wog boys. Wog boys, wog boys. Yeah. Uh, Let's see. Uh, yeah, we had the same thing here with Italians in Australia in the 70s and 80s. They uh, did things, uh, Australians uh, bullied other, you know, Italians and Lebanese and they called them wog boys. Yeah, I'll put it in the chat. There you go. Hey. Oh, <laughs> I got done for the... They think I was being racially stereotypical and it stopped my comment. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Sorry, YouTube. It won't let me type it. Uh, Emily Nob says, I don't blame them for wanting to make sure. Yeah, I mean, the last thing they want to do is spend the next... 35 years of their life or whatever always wondering what if we had done this what if we had got got another opinion what if we'd had another look at it and then by 35 years in the future it's too late the evidence is gone you know xyz red like wine says i have no idea what you're saying hold on guys yeah i can't type it it won't let me type it Hold on. See if I see if I be sneaky about it. No, what what is going on? Hold on, hold on. Okay, it, let me do that. It's weird that Reby can type it, but I can't. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. There you go. It's on the screen. Yes, it does. There you go. It's on the screen. Um, I don't know why YouTube hates me. I think YouTube is being uh, racist against Australians, apparently. Stop being racist against Australians, YouTube. You don't like us anymore? You don't like our spelling? How dare you? (laughs) Hold on. Hold on, guys.
Hold on, everyone. All right, there we go. There we go. Sometimes the microphone moves, and when it moves, it kind of goes like over here, and then you guys can't hear as well, and then it's got to be sort of front on. All right, there we go. I thought that might fix it. Where are the kitty cats tonight? Well, ever since the cats had that uh, Saturday show where everything went wrong, they don't come in here during the show very much anymore. Uh, they're sleeping in the uh, lounge room. So I feed them before the show now, and they don't come in and annoy me. So they're having a nap with a G, Sienna, a G. A wog boy with a G. Yeah, because some people were writing in the comments saying, can't you just lock the cats outside? They're interrupting the show. They make it difficult for us to follow. So. Uh, Gambler says, I changed my photo. If you, yeah, I saw it before. That's really cool. Uh, I can't make it larger, I don't think. I hope everyone can see. To the, uh, to the left, that's Gambler's mom. No, no, I'm just kidding. That's Gambler. And to the right, that's Gambler's mom on the right there. So. There you go. A photo of mother and son. Hope that is uh, cool for everyone to see. Uh huh. It's called vasovagal syncope. It can be preci uh, precipitated by alcohol. Blood pressure drops and fainting occurs. Yeah, it could have been something like that. It's pretty rare though. It doesn't happen that often, but circumstances collide who knows red like one said i had jewish friends growing up and they were bullied for being jewish i don't think that ever um that didn't stop did it i think that is still a thing today that jewish people are bullied isn't that a a known thing Oh, yeah. A future series two by Rebe, the Pet Collective. <laughs> All right, guys, let's get another story. Hold on a second. All right. Hold on. I think that's all I have on Riley. I don't have anything else for you. Okay. So we talked a lot of, about a lot of bad things tonight. This was sent in by Kathy. Uh, apparently, a lost dog found by thermal drone. So they had a thermal drone has been used to find a dog that was missing for 12 days. Ulysses went missing on 20th of December during a walk in Bedfordshire. A team from Nottinghamshire-based charity Drone to Home Spent fewer than two hours searching for the missing Hungarian wirehead Vizala when they were spotted him in nearby Haines on Sunday. The dog's owner, Sam Boyle, is fundraising to buy the charity another drone. So look at the poor doggy. They, put, they couldn't find him and he couldn't get home. And I'll tell you why. The poor dog had a leash on and the leash was tangled in the trees here and he couldn't free himself. So he was stuck and he couldn't go home. He wanted to, but he couldn't go home. So the drone found out where he was and they untangled him. And he's uh, very thin. He lost uh, 12, 12 kilos. Yeah, look, there's a photo of him. You can see how thin he was when they found him. He, he's all just ribs and, ribs and uh, muscle, or not muscle, ribs and... Uh, bones that's all there's nothing left of him apparently it he survived by eating twigs and uh leaves from the tree and uh they had to take him to a vet because they're not supposed to eat that but that's all he could find being trapped to the tree and uh yeah the poor puppy yeah it says ulysses was stuck in a hedgerow 
with his retractable lead tangled and trying and tying him to the spot. His owner and search parties had already looked in the area, albeit in vain. It says drone to home chief executive and former police officer Phil James, who spotted Ulysses, said, I've seen a lot. But this is the first time I've jumped up in the air after finding an animal. The dog has been missing for so long. And uh, let's see if I can... Look, there he is. Back home on a comfy thing, having a nap. It says he lost 10 kilos or 22 pounds in weight and needed veterinary treatment after appearing to live off a diet of sticks and twigs. Yeah, poor baby. It says he returned home on Friday and Miss Boyle said his eyes are bright and tail wagging. Mr. James said he was humbled that Miss Boyle was raising money to buy the charity another drone to find more dogs. Isn't that cool? What a nice story that Ulysses can come home to his family. Look how happy they are to find him. He's like, why'd you leave me out here, Dad? Dad, you didn't come find me. I've been here for ages. I've been trying to get home. Let's see. Oh, is this the drone footage? That's what it looks like. Oh, he was stuck in like the little opening. Look. Yeah, unless you were from the air, you wouldn't even know he was in there. Oh, <laughs> poor baby. Look at that. That's how they found him, with that bright dot on the screen. Poor thing, stuck there for like two weeks. He'd made, look, he'd made a little hole in the, uh, in the bush row or whatever. Oh, he's like, someone found me, finally. I want to go home to my dad. Oh, poor baby. He's like, someone finally found me. He's so happy. Poor puppy. I don't know, maybe rainwater off the leaves when it rained, like dew or uh, rain or whatever had landed on the on the on the leaves of the plant. Oh, that's okay. This one was pretty good. I've never seen a dog found by a drone with uh with a FLIR camera before. I'm not sure. I have a look. Hold on. What's his name? Ulysses. Let's find more about Ulysses. Let's find. Let's see if we can find a, something else about him. Okay. A devoted dog owner spent 12 days, including the whole of Christmas, searching for her lost puppy. Even having barbecues in the forest where she thought the dog had gone missing, uh, just in a bid to try and get some aromas to, to woo him back. Yeah, the trouble is, I think the lead was all tangled up mm. uh, in undergrowth, but she was determined not to give up on Ulis, a Hungarian Vizsla. And Ulis was finally found by a specialist drone team on New Year's Eve tangled up in a bush and near starvation and moments later, oh my goodness, reunited with his owner, Sam. And we can speak to Sam now who has Ulis. Oh my goodness, Sam, Ulis is very, very skinny. What an ordeal. Skin dog. He's very skinny. He's lost 10 kilos in the time that he's been away and when he was poorly afterwards. So now we're trying to build him up and he's starving. But a dog has to has to drink um, at least every three days. How did it? How did he survive without water? It rained so much over the time that he was away. He was just drinking off of leaves. Ah. Um, <laughs> I don't know how I knew that, but I just had a feeling that's exactly what happened. That it probably rained a lot, and he just licked the water off the off the leaves. Poor puppy dog. I mean. 
his name is Ulysses, not uh, Ulysses. It's spelled very similar to the president of the U.S., but um, what a poor doggy. Yeah, he li it rained a lot, and then he just licked up the water that he could find. That's so lucky. You know, I feel terrible, though. His mum actually did barbecues in the area, thinking the dog would come to the smell of the food. That must have been torture for that poor dog. He's like, I can smell the food. It's so close but I can't get to it. I'm trapped. I'm stuck here. Who keeps cooking barbecues near here? I can keep smelling the chicken and the sausages. My mom used to make me sausages, but I can't get to it. The poor dog. All right, let's watch this bit. Eating twigs, eating sticks, just, just to survive really. And it was lucky that we did have the rain so that it did keep him going. Sam, tell us about when Ulis went missing. Um, were you out walking and he was, did he run away or did he, no, did my, you let him off his lead? He'd been out for a lovely walk in the morning, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, he was on his way back home and um, something spooked him and he literally bolted with his lead attached to him. Uh, ran three miles through our village into a neighbouring village across an A road. Um, he was then caught in somebody's drive and a lady closed the gates thinking he was safe and um, she left him, put a post on Facebook to say she'd seen this dog um, and he must have gone straight through the land that he'd been enclosed in, um, straight over some fencing, through hedging and likely was in the hedge from day one from within an hour of him bolting, so really. Obviously the barbecue... But he, he was stuck with so, his lead. So, obviously, the barbecue scents weren't going to tempt him out because he couldn't get out. He was stuck. Whose idea was it to, to get no, a drone, to no. get a thermal drone? I'm th I actually cannot remember. I, huh. don't, I was so obsessed with trying to find him. I think I must have seen something on Facebook and thought, need to get a thermal drone. Uh, so I got in touch with um, Drone to Home, who I think initially said because he'd bolted, it was likely that he would make his way back home. Um, they were aware that there was a lead on him. But um, we really did think that he would try and trek back home. Um, but those days were just the, long, the longest time, yeah. and I didn't really want to think that no. he was caught up. That's, you, do you know what? Whenever my cat Suki's gone missing, it's always the thought that they're trapped somewhere and that you can't go and rescue them. It just that absolutely grips your heart, doesn't it? The, it's not actually the fact that the, the pet might have died. It's that they're trapped and they can't. You can't rescue them. All right, we've got to get back to true crime. But that's that's such a cute story. I'm happy that. Uh, she shared that it's spelled like this. I guess it is uh, Ulysses, not Ulysses. It doesn't have an extra E. Uh, there we go. Yeah, I thought so too, but it must be the crazy. I mean, she named her dog, so she must not. <laughs> uh, let's see. Yeah, poor baby. <laughs> Red like one said, Ping is the male version of Insightful One. Or is she the female version of me? Who knows? All right. We have to get back to true crime, everyone. But that was a nice break from death and people dying and being stabbed and whatever. Let me see if I can grab you another story. We've got a long show tonight because uh, Trish is not here. So you guys get to hang out with me for two and a half hours. Hold on, everyone. Oh, yes, we have this one. We have Curry Richens, grief book author, faces new charges, attempted murder, fraud, and forgery. Yeah, we're going to talk about her. Tried to kill her husband with uh, fentanyl. I'm just trying to find the update that I want. No. <laughs> what are you doing to me? 
Okay, no, that's not it, but that's okay. We'll have to use this one. It says, US children's book author of accused of killing husband also charged with poisoning attempt. Curry Richens, 33, charged with murder last year over alleged murder of Eric Richens, 39, with fentanyl spiked beverage. We've spoken about her before, but uh, here we go. That's a photo of her attending court in Park City, Utah in November last year. And I'm trying to see here. It says, Curry Richens, 33, was charged with aggravated murder last year over the alleged killing of Eric Richens, 39, at their home in Camus in March 2022. Eric was found unresponsive after having a drink to celebrate his wife's business deal. Authorities allege Curry spiked the beverage with fentanyl after a medical examiner found five times the lethal dose of the drug in her husband's system. Prosecutors now allege this was not the first time Curry attempted to poison her husband. In a new charge filed on Monday, authorities allege Eric fell ill after his wife brought him his favorite sandwich on Valentine's Day 2022, just a few weeks before his death. It says, uh, The charging documents state Eric broke out in hives after one bite of the sandwich. He then had to drink a bottle of Benadryl and inject himself with his son's EpiPen before falling asleep. The man later told a friend, I think my wife tried to poison me. Uh, it says, Curry had purchased several dozen pills containing fentanyl, which can cause people to break out in hives, and then allegedly told her housekeeper, who had sold her the drugs, that she needed stronger fentanyl following Eric's initial illness. Prosecutors say that Curry's motives may be financial, as she had opened life insurance policies on Eric without his knowledge, with benefits totaling nearly $2 million. Curry has yet to enter a plea, but has previously denied the allegations. According to her, her husband of nine years slipped into the o her husband of nine years slipped the opioid into the cocktail she had made. In an unusual twist, Curry her herself, a self-published book. She self-published a book titled, Are You With Me? in the wake of her husband's death. The book, which she promoted on local TV, is about how children can process the death of a parent. Curry said at the time that her husband had died unexpectedly and that the death completely took us all by shock. Okay, I don't think it was that shocking to you at all. I think you knew exactly when it was going to happen. Because you're the one who got the fentanyl from your housekeeper. Uh, let me try and find you a good update about it. Something that is not from Court TV. Okay, yes. This warrant reveals Corey Richen's mom, Lisa Darden, is being investigated in connection with the 2006 death of her romantic partner. Corey is the chemist children's book author accused of killing her husband, Eric Richens. Eric died from a lethal dose of fentanyl back in May of 2022. Amanda Gilbert live tonight breaking down why one detective has been looking into Corey Richens' mother's past. Yeah, guys, I've got this search warrant in my hand. Detective, Summit County Detective Jeff O'Driscoll was looking into those close to both Eric and Corey Richens. And that's when he came across this new information. It's been more than two years since Eric Richens died. Since then, his wife, Corey Richens, wrote a children's book about grief and loss. Then she was accused of poisoning him at their home in Camus. Her family's not wavered in their support of Corey. Her mom, Lisa Darden, saying this in an interview with CBS. For anybody who knows Corey, she could not have done this. She'd never do this. But now, a recently unsealed search warrant shows Summit County Detective Jeff O'Driscoll investigated those close to the couple, including Corey's mom. When she went back to get in her bed, he was cold. He discovered back in April 2006, Lisa Darden's romantic partner died unexpectedly. The cause of death, 
ruled drug poisoning from an overdose of oxycodone. O'Driscoll wrote further investigations showed that Lisa Darden had been named as the beneficiary of her partner's estate a short time before her death. The detective would go on to write in the search warrant based on Lisa Darden's proximity to her partner's suspicious overdose death and her relationship with Corey. It is possible she was involved in planning and orchestrating Eric's death. I asked. You know, anytime you hear of a life insurance policy that's like $2 million, unless you're like a person with a huge fortune, I mean, you should be very careful. You should be very careful. Your partner may be trying to kill you. It's it's happened so many times where people have had large life insurance policies put on them, and then magically they die very quickly after. Uh, we can all remember the famous one that happened not long ago, uh, Lori Vallow, who tried to claim the life insurance, and then was told, "Oh, hold on a minute, you're not actually the person listed on the <laughs> on the account." You can't claim it. It's your husband's or your ex-husband's sister. She can claim it. That was I. That's one of the funniest moments in true crime I have ever seen. Hey, bees are life. How are you, my friend? Uh, seeing Laurie Vallow, uh, hearing her on that call, and then you know they basically are like, "Ah, uh, are you sure you're the claimant on the account?" <laughs> and then you know. They just know that she's not, and they're like, yeah, we have to speak to our manager. That was a, a very interesting part of the Lori Vallow story. Uh, but this lady wrote a book on how children can cope with the death of a partner and even went on local TV to talk about it. I mean, she has some absolute balls for going on TV. I mean, if you killed your husband, you don't want people to come looking for anything. So I find her motivation very strange that she wrote a book and then tried to get it publicized, you know, especially if she is found guilty and did, did end up killing her husband, then, you know, why would you make more people look at your story? I find that very strange. Maybe narcissism? Maybe she's narcissistic. Let's see. Let's see what the ABC says about it. It's only a quick one. Attorneys for Corey Richens say she maintains her innocence despite facing new charges. The Utah mother and author is accused of poisoning her husband with fentanyl and then writing a book about grief. Prosecutors now say she forged Eric Richens' signature on life insurance documents the month before his death. Investigators say he had five times the lethal dosage of fentanyl in his system when he died. Yeah, there you go. Five times. That's well, not... Investigators are questioning whether Corey Richens acted alone in the alleged murder of... Uh, we just heard that one, that possibly her mom helped her. But, I mean, five times the lethal LD50 doesn't happen by accident you know someone did that to him apparently a month prior to her arrest in may 2023 the mum of three appeared on good things utah a segment on salt lake city abc affiliate ktvx to promote a book in the segment uh cory richard said her husband of nine years died unexpectedly and that his death completely took us all by shock Prosecutors allege in a new filing Monday that Eric Richards was initially poisoned on Valentine's Day. That's when he had the hives. And then what else does it say? Yeah, apparently he told a, a, told a close friend later that day, I think my wife tried to poison me. Imagine if you had that feeling. It'd be horrible. It says here, Eric Richens did not have any food allergies according to the charging document, which noted that uh, opioids can give people hives. In a text to a friend about the incident on June 18, 2022, 
Corey Richmond claimed her husband never broke, uh, broke out in hives or used an EpiPen, according to the charging document. So she's uh, denying that ever took place. It says, Eric Richards was found dead in the couple's bedroom on March 4th, 2022, nearly a month after the alleged Valentine's Day incident. An autopsy determined that he died from fentanyl intoxication and his level levels in his blood were five times a lethal dosage. Well, she definitely got the stronger fentanyl that she wanted. Hey, we'll see what happens to her and these new charges going on in the future. It says, Corey Richards remains detained as she awaits trial. A preliminary hearing in her case is scheduled for May 15th. So in about a month or, you know, six weeks or so, we'll find out more about what's going to happen with her. I know, right? Marilyn Landis says, did she think she would get away with it? Any younger person that dies randomly like that, of course they're going to do an autopsy, um, you know, because it's unusual, especially a family man who doesn't have any known issues. Of course, the medical examiner is going to find that a little weird. So, yes. Uh, what time is it? Let's have a look. Oh, we've been on almost two hours already. Jeez, what time is it over there? 11? 11 p.m.? Oh no, we've been on an hour and a half. What am I talking about? We didn't start at 10. We started at 10.30. Uh, okay. Let me see. Uh-huh. Let's, let's have a look at this one. LVMPD. Is that the Las Vegas Metro PD? Woman facing murder charge in random shooting that killed carpet cleaner in West Valley. Let's have a look at this. I want to show you something. Let's watch this. It's pretty quiet, so it was really, it was really, you know, odd to hear that something like that could happen. Neighbors speak out after police say a woman shot and killed a carpet cleaner sitting in his van at an apartment complex in the West Valley. And new this afternoon, we have learned the name of the suspect and the victim. The suspect has been identified as 27-year-old Kayla Allery. She's facing numerous charges, including open murder. This is not her first run-in with the law. Court records say she has arson charges from 2022. The Nevada Parole Board says Allery was just released in December related to that incident. Now, here's video you will only see on Fox 5 of the van the victim was in when police say he was shot by Allery. The victim's been identified as 41-year-old Raul Cardoza. Police say it doesn't look like the suspect and victim had any interaction before that shooting. But just before four yesterday afternoon, police said Cardoza was shot at an apartment complex near Fort Apache in Spring Mountain. He was sitting in the van he uses for his carpet cleaning business when police say the suspect was checking car doors in the complex. Someone alerted maintenance workers and she was taken off the property that's when police say she walked toward the van in the parking lot and shot the man inside. I came out, I woke up, my neighbor called around like 4.05, told us to lock our doors because there was a shooting that happened. And uh, I came out and it was already, there was ambulance out here, fire trucks, cops, I, all of them, all of them were out here. We'll continue to bring you updates on the story as we get them. The top. Hold on, everyone. I have more on this. So, she shot a random carpet installer. Let me show you some more. Here. So, she was checking doors on cars in the, in the apartment complex. Sounds odd. Yeah, around 4.06 p.m., police received a report of a shooting at an apartment complex on Apache Road between Spring Mountain and Twain. When they arrived, officers found a man near a van suffering from a gunshot wound. He was taken to University Medical Center Hospital by medical personnel where he later died. Through the investigation, detectives learned the victim was sitting in a van when an unknown person in dark clothing with facial tattoos approached the van and fired a shot, hitting the victim. 
The suspect then ran away. Police identified Allery as the suspect and found her near the scene before arresting her. They're saying anyone with information is urged to call the LVMPD homicide section by phone at 702-828-3521 or email at homicide at lvmpd.com. If you want to remain anonymous, contact Crime Stoppers by phone at 702-385-quadruple-5. And here's the full press briefing on this. Good evening. I'm Jason Johansson, the Homicide Lieutenant with the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. I'm here this evening to brief you on a homicide investigation that we're currently conducting in the apartment complex located directly behind me at the 3600 block of South Fort Apache Road. This is in the area of Fort Apache and Twain, and it's within our Summerlin Area Command. Earlier this afternoon, at a frock, just after 4 p.m., our 911 call center received a call of a shooting that occurred inside the apartment complex located directly behind me. As officers were en route to the location, they were advised that there was one victim that was shot, and it was near the entrance in a white van. As officers arrived inside the apartment complex, they located the victim and began to provide medical aid for him until medical arrived at her on scene, who transported him to the University Medical Center, where unfortunately he was later pronounced deceased from his injuries. As officers initially arrived here on scene, they immediately began contacting several other witnesses who were in the apartment complex who provided a suspect description of a possibly white male with facial tattoos and neck tattoos, dark clothing, carrying numerous bags, who had fled out the front entrance of the apartment complex. Thanks to those quick actions of getting that suspect description, our patrol officers who were still responding to the area responded to the neighborhood just to the east of here, where they located the possible suspect and took her, it ended up being a female, uh, into custody without further incident. Based on those details, our homicide has come out, responded, we've taken over this investigation. What we know is that our suspect was inside the apartment complex. Does we, At this time, we do not believe that she lives there, that she was checking doors to cars, likely to probably burglarize those cars. Several citizens within the apartment complex notified the leasing manager, who then asked the maintenance workers to go locate this person and get them off of property. While that is going on, our victim and his brother are sitting inside their white van, which is a carpet cleaning company van. And they're here just doing their job, doing an estimate for to clean someone's carpet, sitting in their van as this is all occurring with trying to get the suspect out of the apartment complex. Our suspect then quickly approaches the white van, removes a handgun and shoots our victim, who's the driver of the white van, while he's sitting in the van. Right now, we have no indication at all that our victim had any interaction with our suspect prior to that occurring. Our suspect then fled out of the gate. Thanks to the quick actions, not only by the apartment complex calling 911 immediately and getting the officer response here, but thanks to the quick response by the officers who initially arrived here on scene, that suspect is in custody. They were taken custody, as I mentioned earlier, just east of here. And thankfully, we were able to get them in custody before any other violent acts occurred. Right, right. No indication that this is appears to be a random shooting. A completely innocent, hardworking human being who's here at work uh, uh, is, is shot and killed while doing their job. Uh, that is completely unrelated in any sense. So, with that, I have no further uh, details. Our homicide guys are here on scene, doing our investigation as we speak right now, canvassing for video, which we do have related to this incident. We're interviewing additional witnesses and processing our scene, which will be for the next few hours. I urge anyone with any information related to this investigation to please reach out to the LBMPD homicide section or reach out for Crime Stoppers of Nevada. There you go. There's the police press conference, even though it was a bit scratchy. Um, while we're on that break, I got an email. And I want to have a look. Hold on. Let me see. Uh, it is uh, 
It is from Laura T. Laura T used the uh, Ko-Fi or Coffee uh, link. And she says, cookies for Ping. Thanks for all your hard work and filling our nights with Ping. Thank you. I appreciate it. I know right now with the cost of living and that, it is really difficult for everyone, especially leading up to Easter. Um, but I really appreciate the support of the channel. It is uh, it is much appreciated. I mean, I try to give you guys as many shows a, as I can each, each week, uh, including, you know, the late shows, extra shows where I can. The people like Laura who are able to uh, send in a donation here and there, they're the people who fund those late shows, those uh, extra one hour, one and a half hours every night, except for last night and tonight because we're doing for Trish, we're doing a longer show. But other nights, they're, they're the people you can thank for that. So I appreciate that. Thank you. I appreciate you guys too. Very kind. Very, very kind. All right. And, uh, you know, actually, do you guys want to hear a weird story? I was going to bed last night and I like bolted upright in bed and I said to myself, I don't think I ever read out Moonlight View's message on her donation from like two weeks ago. And I don't know why it hit me then at that time, but I was like, I had like a moment of panic that I never read it out. I do this often and I'm like, because I don't want to offend anyone and I don't want to feel like they're not being heard. And I was like, did I, did I not? And I totally couldn't remember. And um, yeah, it, it scared me at like 1 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> I don't know why I remembered it at that point. No idea. It just came to my head. Uh, yeah. So thank you, Moonlight View, for that donation the other week. <laughs> I, I don't know why I thought I didn't say thank you two weeks ago. Uh, but yes, it was very kind of you. And I and your message was very kind as well. All right. Let me get to you another story. How about a missing woman? Tammy Lynn Sturgeon. I don't know her, but we can talk about her. Searchers recover missing Gillette woman's cell phone, but no sign of her. Huh. Let's have a look. It says, after three days of a massive multi-agency search, there is no sign of Tammy Lynn Sturgeon, the 55-year-old Gillette Wyoming woman who went missing Saturday afternoon in rugged terrain after a day of shed hunting with her husband. All that's been recovered so far is Sturgeon's missing phone, the very thing that led, her, led to her disappearance, according to her husband. Sturgeon believed her phone was missing, so they split up and searched in the Yellow Hammer uh, Buttes area where they were shed hunting to find it, the Campbell County Sheriff's Office reports. Sturgeon's husband reported her missing around 7 p.m. Saturday, saying he hadn't seen or heard from her for several hours, so he left the area to find a place to contact Campbell County Sheriff's Office dispatch. They're saying Sturgeon's phone was discovered Tuesday by the side... Wait. They said her phone was discovered Tuesday on the side-by-side -side she and her husband had been using that day. Hmm. They said it's not uncommon for individuals to misplace their phones. They think it's in one place and come to find out it's probably the last place they thought it, they'd look. And there are a lot of nooks and crannies on a side-by-side. -side. Unfortunately, Reynolds said the phone's discovery hasn't assisted the ongoing search effort which after three nights of cold and snow is nearing a threshold of recovery effort. Guys, give me one second. Hold on.
All right, there we go. Sorry. It's like 2 o'clock here, so there's always stuff happening. Look. Got a package. Shall we open it? <laughs> Shall we open the package? What is it? What is it, Ping? Tell us what it is. Let's see what it is. We shack like we're doing... um. Like a TV show? What is it? Oh. Let's have a look. What is it? Oh, okay. The tan cream for the for the missus. She must have ordered hand cream. What is this? I have no idea what this is. What is this? No idea. Oh, okay. Something else for Mrs. It's a cooking weight calibration set. Ah, it's like for calibrating kitchen scales. She must have purchased it from the Amazon sale. <laughs> It's so like they actually register the correct weight when you're doing like salt and that, like small amounts. Okay, because she likes to make pastries. There you go. No, no cookies. No cookies. Sorry. No cookies. I'll put that there for now. Uh, yes. All right. Sorry about that. I hate having to break up the show. All right, let's go back. Let's talk about this story. So this missing woman, I, she's been missing for a long time. Finding her phone in a side-by-side, -side, is that like a horse thing? What is a side-by-side -side? on a side-by-side? -side? Let's have a look. What is that? Oh, like a four-wheel ATV thing. Okay. It's like a, yeah, an ATV. Why do they call it a side-by-side? -side? Oh, because you can sit next to each other. Okay. So they were in a side-by-side -side or an ATV and they found the phone in the ATV that they thought she had lost at some point while they were shed hunting. And they said around a dozen volunteers spent Tuesday afternoon during, doing a grid search of the area around Yellowhammer Buttes or Boots. A grid search is when searches line up in a row and slowly but meticulously cover a small area at a time, generally less than a mile. Reynolds said multiple methods have been used in the search for sturgeon. The first and third searches were trying to do a broader, bigger circumference up to a mile away to see if we could get the direction to travel. It's pretty rough terrain and we have radio contact with everyone for their safety. On Monday afternoon, five people boarded a Black Hawk helicopter from Rapid City, South Dakota, to do an aerial search of the area. Even with technology like thermal spotters, the helicopter search yielded no tangible clues to her location. They felt like they canvassed the area pretty well, so today we're back out there with our search and rescue and deputies trying to do a smaller grid search to get the direction of travel. Wow, they still can't find her. This is a photo of her. This is the lady who's missing. Um, her name is Tammy Lynn Sturgeon. 55 years old from Wyoming. Let me try and see if I can get anything else about Miss Tammy Lynn and the search for her. There is literally no videos of her missing disappearance at all. There's only country newspapers in Gillette County that are covering it. No major news station has picked it up. Apparently, this red circle is the area where she is missing. It's very mountainous terrain, you can tell by the map. But there is no videos on her at all. Yeah. Let me just double check. Sometimes if you take out the middle name... Country 17? Nope. All very similar. Yeah, no, no videos that we could watch at all about her missing. Apparently she was an athlete, though. Let's have a look. 
No, that's not her. She's not Canadian. <laughs> okay, she wasn't an athlete. It was a different Tammy Sturgeon who lives in Canada. I cannot find anything about this woman. Here, the Casper Star Tribune paper. There are all these tiny little papers, like little local papers. It says Gillette. A Gillette woman who went missing while trying to find her cell phone Saturday south of Bishop Road has not been found, although her phone has been located in a side-by-side. She and her husband drove to the area. Tammy Lynn Sturgeon, 55, and her 60-year-old husband first went to Yellowhammer to shed hunt. What is a shed hunt? So... I have no idea. What what the hell is shed hunting? I, I'm trying to figure out what the hell it is. What is what is shed hunting? Shed hunting. Okay, shed hunting, the gathering of shed antlers in the wild, often to sell. Sounds innocuous, but as a hunter and a biologist, uh, so they're supposed, you're supposed to go roaming around and you're looking for antlers that have dropped off either from death or other reasons that are no longer on the animal. And they clean them up and polish them and, you know, sell them to people as decoration in their home or, you know whatever so there's big money in it apparently so they shed the antlers and then people buy them so that's what they were doing they were looking for antlers i've never heard of this before but i don't live in a location where animals animals have antlers so there you go if you don't know what shed hunting was now you do yeah collecting antlers that have been shed that's right. Laura T says, so she's missing, but the, not the husband. Yeah, the husband's not missing, just she is. She thought she lost her phone, so they split up. She went to walk around and look for it, and he took the side-by-side. And um, they haven't been able to find her at all. They found her phone. It ended up being in the, the ATV that they borrowed, or the side-by-side, but... They have not been able to find her, not at all. But there are no, no articles or, or anything that I can show you about her. Um, that's a shame, you know. Sometimes our older people don't get the media attention that they should, like this lady. There's only little tiny papers covering her story. And she's been missing already for three days. Yeah, nothing. If I search YouTube, nothing. Okay, that's a shame. It really is. Uh, so let's try and find out any more information about her. Because that shouldn't be the case. See, during the search for her phone, she and her husband became separated, and after he searched for her on his own, he called deputies to report her missing about 7 p.m. the same day. A multi-agency search has continued since Sturgeon was reported missing, but they have found no sign of her. Under Sheriff Quinton Reynolds said Tuesday morning, searches in a helicopter Monday didn't spot anything. Search and rescue efforts were paused Monday night before dark for safety of the searches and began again 7 a.m. on Tuesday. Along with local law enforcement, Reynolds said the sheriff's office is also coordinating with about 12 to 15 volunteers who are searching on foot. Reynolds said the area Sturgeon disappeared in has two entry points. The main focus is trying to determine which way Sturgeon would have headed. We're trying to figure out what her thinking was at the time. Does she try and go north where she thinks her husband still is in the ATV? 
or does she try to go to lights and the noise? Sturgeon would have walked miles in either direction. She was last seen to reach a road or the coal mine, adding that there are some places to shelter where she could have warmed up. But the amount of time Sturgeon's been outdoors in the cold and snow is a concern. Hmm. What do you guys think? Let me know. Is she out there? Something we should be concerned about? Anything we should, uh, you know, do you think she's going to be found? Do you think it's suspicious? Like, why would you not go search for the phone together? Why would you not hop off your side by side and strip it apart looking for the phone first? Seems something is a little kooky. Like, why would you just be like, sure, love. You just go off in that direction with no mobile phone to go search for your mobile phone. Let me take our survival ATV and my mobile phone and let's just part ways here. Sounds a bit odd. Moonlight View says dogs love hoof trimmings from horses when the farrier comes to trim and chew. Laura T says, yeah, I hope no foul play. Hmm. I think we should keep an eye on this one. Ask Barry Morphew. Okay, we will. He he has a new show every Saturday for husbands to ring up and uh, get advice on their wives. It's called Marriage Marriage for Marriage for White Men with with Barry Morphew. Okay, that, um, that he doesn't really have a show. I'm just joking. I don't think anyone would watch that show to be honest. Maybe serial killers. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was thinking. Like, they were going out there, hunting wild sheds out there. <laughs> wild sheds that move around and you got to shoot them. And I was like, that's a weird type of thing. Lux says, why would she walk away with no phone? Yeah, it's a little... Why would, why would you let your wife walk away with no phone, with no survival gear, with no contact to you? Like, if you've got the ATV, wouldn't you give her your phone? Because you've got the the car. Like, at least you can go back to safety. She can't. It's like a safety issue. She should have had the mobile phone. Like, even if it's his mobile phone, she should have had it, you know. Hey, Tharvi, how are you, my friend? Where'd you pop up from? I think we're just about to wrap up though, Tharvi. We've been on for about two hours. And I think we're just about run out of uh, stories and things to talk about. Tried to do as long a shows as I can for you all while Trish was away. Just check that I've got anything else. Uh, there's the Diddy, Sean, Sean Diddy stuff, but I don't really want to do that. Apparently, they did find, on Tuesday, investigators uncovered a shoe print and a cigarette, a cigarette butt matching the brand that Sturgeon smoked. They said the print and the butt were found in the vicinity where her husband last saw her. So maybe she came back to the same area and was like, where's my husband? Why did he take off? Uh, we'll see. It says, neighboring... Uh, counties have pitched in to aid with the search, with teams utilizing a drone from Crook County on Wednesday. A Black Hawk helicopter from South Dakota conducted an aerial sweep over the area on Monday. We'll check back tomorrow and see if we can find anything. All right, I've got one last story for the night. A missing... Oh... Well, this is interesting. Oh, she may have been found. Let me just check something, because when I click on it now, it says it's not available. Maybe maybe she was uh, located. Um, uh, da, da, da. Hmm.
Let me see. So there's a missing girl. It says, Dearborn police appeal for public's help to find missing teen Ariana Birch. But when I click on the police department message for it, it's gone. Hold on, guys. Let me check Twitter. Uh huh, uh huh. Yeah, she was found safe. Okay. I can show you. See, missing juvenile found safe. The Dearborn Police Department has safely located Ariana Birch, a female, a juvenile female who's been missing since March 20, 2024. The 14-year-old has been located safely <clears throat> as of today, Wednesday, March 27th. So she was missing for about a week. Um, but the interesting thing is, the interesting thing, the article that came out when she went missing said, this is the second time in one year that she had run away and went missing. So she's probably going to now be classed as a habitual runaway with the police department, unfortunately. Because it says, 14-year-old girl vanishes for second time in less than a year. It says, local reports indicate that Birch also vanished last May after leaving her home in Dearborn. And I was trying to find anything about it. So, But that's good. The fact she was found safe and well, that's all we can ever ask for. But here's the article from last year. 13-year-old girl missing after leaving Dearborn home in pajamas. Ariana Birch, last seen near Carlisle Street in Telegraph Road. Same girl went missing this year, but in March, almost one year to the day, just a couple of, about a month short. So, but hey, they found her again. They brought her back home. She's fine. So that's good news. Kathy Lynch says, I love the two hour shows. Well, I wish we could do two hours every night, but we can't. Because uh, we have to hop off for Trish and let her go at 10.30. And I can't go any earlier because from next week, we will come off Daylight Savings and my show will be at 11 a.m. in the morning already. If I brought it back by an hour to do two and a, two hours or two and a half hours, I'd be going out at 10 a.m. in the morning every morning. It's a little early. It's a little early. Hold on. Who's messaging me? Yes. Sorry, there's Mrs. She wants wants to know if I want the Easter cookies. And I was like, yes, Easter cookies. <laughs> there's these nice Easter cookies from the European bakery. And she's like, they close at 4.30. Do you want me to go get them? And I'm like, yes, get the cookies. There were people there from 20 countries, including Australia. Oh, you went to a 50th reunion. Wow. You had Australians at your 50th reunion? That's pretty cool. You'll have to tell us about it. Barbie, send me an email if you want at sundaywithping at gmail.com and let me know about it because I'd, I'd like to know about it. Trev has good EV. They use like a radio. Okay, my friend Juicy Jewels, I, I, I don't speak Juicy Jewels, so T-Rev has good EV. I don't know, I don't know my friend, I can't uh, und undecipher that one. Normally I can, but not that one I cannot. Uh, but I think we're going to wrap up for the night. My voice is starting to go. We've been on for uh, just over two hours, two hours. I... I Thank you all. It's been fun being on for uh, longer shows for the last two days. That has been a real treat. I uh, hope everyone's had a lot of fun. Should we do more opening <laughs> opening packages with Ping next week? Hold on. Oh, yeah, that's okay. Um, should we do more opening random things that people order to me on next week's show? That would be more Amazon packages. 
Uh, but yeah, we'll be back tomorrow night at um uh yeah yeah I get it, juicy drills. Yeah, I've seen other stuff. Every one of those posts that I've seen is like, I see water, and it's like. Why do you always see water? Is that the only thing you guys can see? Is that the only thing that comes in your visions is water? It's yeah, it's a bit weird. Hey, where'd I go? There we go. Um, yeah, I love you guys. Thank you so much for being great supporters of this channel. Uh, we have so many great people who help out. It really is appreciated. And um, tomorrow we'll be back with the nine o'clock show. And then, because Trish is back, we'll have the late show after Trish as well. So, and then you've got me all Easter weekend as well. I'll be here. I'm not going anywhere for Easter weekend. So, yeah, we can hang out. And uh, I'll be here on Easter, Good Friday, Easter Saturday, Easter Sunday, and Easter Monday. So, we'll celebrate Easter together over the weekend. And, uh, yeah, we'll hang out each evening and don't know we'll find things to talk about hopefully hopefully an easter miracle and sebastian rogers is found that'd be great I, i'd really like that that'd be a really nice easter miracle um <laughs> yeah <laughs> send me random i open it up and it's a broom that would be very funny moonlight view by the way thanks for your help moonlight view in the chat i appreciate it and um I will see you guys tomorrow at 9 p.m. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you to the people in this video that's about to play. You guys are awesome. Peace out. See you tomorrow night. Bye-bye, everyone. See you later.